Good morning, everybody. It is man coverage, October 9, 2022. We're talking college football, week six, Knoxville, Nate, James Bonneville, the quarterback, Steve Belisari. How are you gentlemen doing this morning? Good, man. Happy to be here. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. We got a lot to unpack today. We're going to break down, obviously, the big win in East Lansing. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I got a little nervous on the uh, the opening uh, part of the game when that <laughs> pick six uh, occurred and, and it, it became 7-7 seven, seven really quick. And uh, I got a little nervous, but after that, uh, things started to uh, go the right direction. So I'm happy with the way that one worked out. We obviously had a big game yesterday uh, down in Baton Rouge, the big red stick. And uh, we're going to get into that today as well. Um, but first, I think we need to discuss what happened uh, down in the old Tuscaloosa last night. We had a, uh, a, a matchup that was supposed to be a little higher uh, rated than it, than it ended up being with Texas A&M having already lost several games. But they put up a good fight yesterday. I mean, um, you got to give Jimbo a little bit of credit for his game plan. Now, you know, this was a Bama team that had no Bryce Young. Uh, but still, you know, it's still Bama. Uh, they still got Will Anderson. They've still got a pretty solid defense and a good running game. So uh, you got to give Texas A&M some credit for hanging in there. And they had a chance to win the game. Uh, what was your guys, uh, Steve, I'll ask you first. Did you, uh, uh, did you expect Texas A&M to put up that big of a fight? And what was your overall reaction uh, seeing Bama come down to the last play with Jimbo? You knew Jimbo and that team was going to be ready to play, right? Um, given all the back and forth and kind of the, the antics we saw in the offseason. But, um, you know, Alabama turned the ball over four times and yeah. still won, which is impressive. Um, but, you know, Texas A&M, they had a couple key turnovers right after, you know, they intercepted. And they just the timing of it was off. And I think uh, A&M probably, if they could redo it again, that last play of the game, they'd call something a little bit different, right? I mean, they were – if you look at fourth down to go or game to go with Nick Saban and what they do typically, right? Cover zero and they're bringing more than you can block. Yeah. That's what he's done for 30 plus years. And that's what they did at the end of the game and they locked it down and they won. So not a ton of surprises in that game, in my opinion, it was a good hard fought game and Alabama did what they needed to do to overcome turnovers. Yeah, James, what did you think about um, A&M's game plan and, and what did you think about, Mm -hmm. um, you know, Alabama playing without the Heisman Trophy winning quarterback and still being able to win. What, what was your thoughts on that? Well, honestly, I looked at, uh, at Alabama as being very one dimensional, uh, just trying to run the ball as much as they can. I mean, granted, it doesn't hurt when you have Jameer Gibbs as your, one of your running backs, too. And Milroy's got, you know, incredible wheels. But you, you could definitely tell they were trying to really lean into that. Uh, I, but at the end of the day, like I get back to Steve's comment on that fourth down play. I'm surprised they didn't try to isolate um, Stewart because, you know, they're going to run man cover, press man coverage and blitz and run a quarter route to Stewart because Stewart was having a hell of a game. And we talked about him, you know, during the recruiting segments about how yeah. this kid was really up and coming. It's going to be nice to see how this kid matures over time. Um to see what he becomes as a receiver, but he really stood out last night. I, I, I was shocked at how AM was able to throw on that uh, that secondary of Alabama. I mean that I mean we've been talking quite a bit about how uh, Alabama's really good on the edge and getting pressure on quarterbacks and Haynes King still put up quite a few yards last night. So yeah, it was it was I was pretty impressed with the the offensive line of AM holding up at the end there. I know Jordan uh uh or excuse me, Dallas Turner uh had two sacks, but Will Anderson didn't get home. And yeah. you know, down the stretch, um, you know, they they were able to you know get get the passes off. You know, if he gets sacked there on that last drive, they they have they were out of timeouts, the game was over. Um, so I was pretty impressed with AM's O line. Um, just looking at the quarterback, Steve, what, what was your thoughts about um, King? You know, we obviously, they, they, he started the season. They went to Johnson. Uh, Johnson's hurt his, broke his thumb, and they moved back to King. I was pretty impressed with him last night, honestly. Um, you know, he's not the greatest quarterback I've ever seen in my life, but I thought he actually 
uh, played pretty decent yesterday. What was your overall <laughs> thoughts on on the A and M quarterback and uh, how he played uh, last night? Uh, you know, he already mentioned it. He stood in the pocket and made a lot of big throws. Um, yeah. And that's the one way you can beat an Alabama team, right? They'll bring pressure and they want to make you move and get outside of the pocket and get flustered. And if you can stand there and look down the barrel and still make those throws, you're going to be successful. And you saw that, you know, late in the game, especially, right? There are some really wide open passes in the middle of the field. Yeah. And when you play zero coverage and you blitz like that, that's where you got to be exposed. So you got to be able to hang in there and, and make those throws. And he did a really good job of that. I mean, he looked good last night. Yeah, I thought so too, uh, especially kind of in a, a tough environment in a tough situation considering that, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of gone back and forth and you know how it is, Steve, the quarterback gets all the glory when you win and, and gets all the blame when you lose um, whether, whether it's right or not, uh, that's just kind of how it goes. So I was pretty impressed with him. What last question on this game, I'm going to ask both of you. I know it's, it's fourth down, right? Or it's the last play of the game. There's no time left. But would you ever consider running the ball right there, considering the running back you have and uh, considering the, you know, Super Bowl, Marshawn Lynch shit? I mean, do you, would you ever would you ever hand the ball off on that or no? The way that game was going, no. Yeah. But, right? I mean, you look what's happened in the NFL, especially with the same quarterback twice at the end of a game in the goal, you know, yard to go. And they lose the Super Bowl by throwing it, and then they lose the game in overtime by throwing it. It just – it's hard to to say what you would do, but second guessing it, I wouldn't run against Alabama's front four though. Yeah, in that situation, no way. Yeah. Right? I mean, I'm going to take a spot in the middle of the field because, again, when you look at the coverage, they're using the sideline as their friend, and that's how that all worked out at the end of that game. So finding a way to exploit the middle of the field, and it's hard to do, right? That, but that's where I would have tried to live. I I got two things with that. One, um, David Onchain is not Marshawn Lynch. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> he's good though. He's good. But I mean, Marshawn Lynch is a, tra a tractor trailer. You know, that guy could take out anything. Um, but, it, you know, it, it, it just like Steve was saying before, I mean, you, you can't, you can't play Monday morning quarterback on something like this because no Monday morning quarterback ever has ever been fired. You could always say, come back. Well, I would have done it differently. I mean, I, I only thing I probably would have changed a little bit is maybe gone to a corner route and isolated him more, just try to give him more of a chance. Cause it just seemed a very odd throw with Haynes King, not having that kind of an arm. If he was Dan Marino, sure. But I don't think he's got that kind of a cannon throwing that kind of a pass. So. Yeah, but even if he caught it, he doesn't score. That's true. That's it's a good exciting. point. I mean, and that's the yeah. problem with that route. you got to have a guy that knows the where to get to and how to break that off. And he broke it off short because he was yeah. getting pressure, right? So, that, I mean, that's a tough play to run in that situation. Yeah. yeah he wasn't in the end zone. And, and, yeah, obviously we can always do the the Monday morning quarterback crap. But uh, I, think he, I think old uh, Jimbo deserves some criticism. I mean – uh, the guy is getting paid $10 million a year, um, and he's not getting it done. I mean, it, it, they have tons of talent on that team. Let's let's not kid ourselves. There's five stars all over the place. Uh, we got to see a little bit of Walter Nolan uh, last night, the defensive lineman who was a top two player in the entire country, played his final year of high school ball here in Knoxville. He looked good. Uh, the wide receiver that we mentioned, the, the freshman that me and James talked about uh, in the preseason, uh, Evan Stewart, he had over 100 yards receiving. Uh, Achain, the running back's good. I mean, let, let's let's not kid ourselves. This team's loaded with talent, and um, you know they he can't be five be, and one. Yeah, they should be five and one right now, and um, yeah. they're not. And so mm -hmm. I, the last question until we move to another game: Does he survive this year? Do you guys think so, Steve? I'll ask you first. Is is he the yeah, coach next I mean, year at AM? They string a couple games together, do well in a bowl game. Uh, you know, the first half of this season is forgotten pretty quickly, right? That's just the way the world works when it comes to you got to win games, right? And if they, if they went out here and, you know, make a run in the SEC, put up a big, good bowl, bowl game, they'll recruit again and people will be happy. And think about what's happened in A&M prior to this, right? This has been pretty similar, unfortunately. So, yeah. And, and if you look at the coaching carousel, right? You got a couple vacancies where guys have been fired early and there's no one getting hired. Who are you yeah. going to bring in? Yeah, I don't know. So, what do you think, James? Do you think they're going to fire him? I have two numbers for you to look, think about. Well, one number, eighty-five million. If they want to fire me, 
I'd be the first in line. Fire me. I'll take the 85 million. I'll pack my bags. You tell me which door to walk out of, and I will be completely happy. But you and I both know they ain't spending 85 million freaking dollars. Is that is that his buyout if they fired him right now? It's guaranteed. Guaranteed. Well, then he's guaranteed to be the coach. I, I I knew that he had a hundred million dollar contract, but I didn't know uh, I didn't know he had eighty five mil left on that bad boy. Um, well, did you hear the guy in the Paul Feinbaum show was making a crack about it'd be easier to hire a hitman than pay yeah, out his I did buyout? Hear that. I'm like, I didn't hear that. I'm like, it's as dumb as the guy from <laughs> Tumor's Corner saying he like killed he, the tree. He, he killed the tree. I'm like. Man, you're a moron. What an what idiot who commits a goddamn crime and then calls a national radio show and tells everybody um, and then gets arrested for attempted murder on a tree. Uh, I, only I, only Auburn and Alabama fans can pull that off. Um, <laughs> my but, God. It's, you can't make this shit up. Hey, but, but $85 million, I'd be more than happy to be fired. I'll walk out the door smiling. I'd be yeah. happy. No, no. We'll, 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 talk about, uh, we'll talk about the uh, – the coaching carousel here in a minute for sure. And uh, there's a, a guy who took 17 million to, uh, uh, to leave uh, Baton Rouge and was, was pretty happy about it. We'll, we'll get into that game too, but I want to, I want to get everybody's thoughts on the Buckeyes yesterday. Obviously I mentioned, uh, you know, started off a little bit Rocky, but let's be honest, uh, Steve, CJ recovered. Um, he only threw five incompletions all day and he had six touchdowns. So uh, this offense to me, has just been phenomenal, especially considering Travion's been hurt, uh, hasn't played, you know, he played last night and played pretty well, but he hasn't, you know, been consistently in the lineup. He's been banged up. Jackson Smith and Jigba hasn't played really since the third play of the game. And to see this offense continue to roll uh, like it has, has just been, has been ridiculously impressive in my opinion. Um, I think it all starts in my opinion with the QB and up front, this offensive line is head over heels better than it was last year, in my opinion. Uh, moving Paris Johnson to left tackle, Dewan Jones, I think, has gotten better. The interior guys have played well. Uh, what was your thoughts yesterday, uh, Steve? I'll ask you first on the um, the Buckeyes' performance, the offense, and uh, what they've been able to do without some of their stars in there. No, I agree with everything you said. I mean, if you look at the start, it was the first road game of the year. Um, you know, so new schedule for these kids and something they haven't experienced yet. And hey, you knew that Coach Tucker was going to have that team ready to go. Yep. Um, and they came out and gave a couple of good swings at first. But then we got right in the groove and did what we did. I mean, we dismantled them. If you go look at the stats and look, I mean, we kind of did whatever we wanted, right? I think we averaged, what, five and a half a carry, right? And it all starts with that group up front offensively. But what I'd like to see, too, is now we're starting to add a little wrinkle here and there every week, right? And you kind of notice that. Like, we're adding a new little little bit of motion or different things to set some things up. Actually, we're running some plays that Alabama ran against us in the, in the national championship game a couple of years ago, right? Um, so it, it's interesting to see how we're continuing to evolve. But we're not even full speed yet, right? Yeah. We, we're banged up in the back end. We're running back by committee. And our best receiver hasn't even played yet. Yeah. Um, but what Marvin Harrison Jr. and Fleming and Smith and Jake, I mean, what they're doing, forget about it. Well, who do you pick? Yeah. I mean, I the mean, last touchdown. Who, 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 who do you try to shut down? I mean, I don't I don't know who you try and take away uh, or roll your coverage to. I mean, I have no clue. Well, and if you look at the last touchdown pass you to the Harrison Jr., they had him double covered. They were doing brackets, right? So that corner didn't do his job. He was supposed to force him inside. He saw the safety coming down. He still beat him to the outside and caught a fade. That shouldn't ever happen. He was double covered. So it's a it's a good thing, a good problem to have. No doubt. And if you look at the uh, stat line yesterday, James, uh, Egbuka had five catches for 143 yards. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. had seven catches for 131 and three touchdowns. And then, uh, holy shit, Julian Fleming has showed up to the party. Uh, he's really played well this year, and it, and it looks like it was just the injuries that were kind of holding him back. He had four catches for 81 yards and a touchdown yesterday, and he's really been stepping up. Um, I don't think Mayan Williams played at all yesterday. He um, didn't. I think no, he, he was, was – I think out. they held him out with injury. Yeah. And, you know, that guy has been our, our, our number one running back, and we didn't miss a beat. We ran for 240 yards on Mel Tucker's defense. 
James, what what do you think about what's going on with the offense right now? It doesn't seem like uh, they're skipping a beat at all. And and uh, Jim Knowles has definitely improved this defense. What were your thoughts on the Buckeyes yesterday? Well, one thing for certain is a stat came up this morning that kind of blew me away. That C.J. Stroud now has moved into second all time in passing touchdowns in Ohio State history. It, this has only been a year and a half, right? And he's already beat Justin Fields. I mean, it, it, this is crazy at the rate he is going right now. And it just shows you not only how physically gifty he is, but really how good a quarterback he could be at the next level. Um, I mean, this kind of goes, I, I've been thinking about this, Steve. If you were a defensive coordinator, how do you prepare for Ohio State? I mean, because it's it's a pick your poison type of game. I mean, w- what would you do in that situation? Yeah, that's <clears throat> depends on personnel. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I look at what Nick Saban does, and if you go throughout history, right, he's been able to dictate and make teams one dimensional. Yeah. So you try to get them one dimensional, um, and if I'm going to pick my poison, I want Ohio State running the ball versus throwing it. But I don't know how you get there. Um, you got to get CJ off his mark, put pressure on him. But if you do that, you're going to have one on one on the outside, and then you got big receivers running down the middle of the field. Like it's tough, right? You got to match up and you got to hope your guys can play one on one coverage and win. Yeah, good luck with that. And it's uh, a hope yeah. strategy, unfortunately, right? I mean, I don't know who has three back end top cover guys in college football yeah. that can go lock people down. Well, yeah, and then when you get uh, JSN back and have Smith and Jigba out there, then you're going to have to have four. And let's right. be honest, Kate, Staver, uh, Kate Stover's look pretty good too. Uh, and then you got that running game mm-hmm. come after you. So, um, you know, all things offensively look really good. The only, um, you know, and I'm, I'm nitpicking here, honestly, just the way that they've been playing. Uh, I can't really complain about anything, but – I'm still going to. Uh, the the secondary has has worried me a little bit. I mean, Denzel Burke looks. I don't care what jersey number he wears. I can always tell who it is um, without seeing the name on the back of the jersey. He looks like a different player this year. He struggled um, covering guys in man. He's he's looked like he's been lost at times in zone. And then uh, Kim Brown yesterday was just horrible to the point where they had to take him out of the game. Are you concerned at all about the corner, Steve? No, not right now. I mean, here's the reality. We're doing some things on defense that are putting those guys in tough spots, right? I mean, I was just talking about it. Um, we want to bring pressure, and we're putting them on an island. And, you know, unfortunately, they're going to make plays. Are there things we'd like to see tuned up? Absolutely, right? I mean, but I mean, go look at the stats. We only gave up 195 yards passing and seven rushing. So yeah. I'm not too concerned, right? I mean, in the grand scheme of thing, the flow is working what they're calling and how they're doing it. If they're going to give up some plays because we're putting those guys on an island, I can live with that. Right. I mean, if that's a systemic thing and it's happening all the time, like that's a bigger problem. But if you just look at the stats and the flow of the game, we're in a good spot. Yeah, no, that's true. And and Michael Hall Jr. Is just been a beast all year. And uh, Tommy Eichenberg. Oh my God. That guy is, he's a phenomenal linebacker. I mean, I'm starting to put him up there with, with, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I'm starting to put him up there with, you know, Hawk and uh, Spielman and, and Katzenmoyer and Matt Wilhelm and everybody. I mean, he, he can cover. He can stop the run. Um, Jim Knowles knows what the hell he's doing, and it looks like a completely different defense. Uh, Bonneville, what did you think about uh, what Knowles has done so far uh, uh, defensively? Well, I mean, unless you're Helen Keller, you could see this is an upgrade compared to last year. Like, you're not running base stuff all the freaking time. Uh, it, it, it's it's an upgrade. And, you know, quite frankly, I think it allows these guys to utilize their skills. I mean, you've been talking about, uh, uh, about Eichenberg. He's been, ever since that bowl game last year, where he seemed like he was everywhere. You know, it, 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 it's been a complete change. Where the linebacker play early on of the year, I mean, heck, the Oregon game, the Minnesota game, I mean, quite they, they couldn't find the hole if they tried. It was really, it was tough. And they just seemed like there's a lot of re, uh, insurgents on this team to be a lot better this year. And quite frankly, I, I mean, you look at the state of where the, the game is at right now, I, I'm 
I'm still kind of shocked. Like we talked about last week, why weren't they picked number one? You know, I mean, Georgia barely beat Mizzou. I'm sorry, Mizzou sucks. Yeah. I, I, I mean, Alabama beats A&M, and you know, I, I know what's going to happen. They're going to trade a few votes. They're going to keep Ohio State at three. And oh, yeah. The reason being, well, well, they they beat Notre Dame by 15. Last time I saw, they were they were number five. Yeah, they're falling back a little bit, but. <laughs> it, that doesn't matter. They When we played them, they were ranked number five, and we beat them in the opener. I mean, the opener is always going to be a little bit suspect as far as you know, execution and all that, but they, they won the game and I thought played pretty well. And I, I've never, as I said, that, that next day on uh, Sunday after the game, I've never seen a team beat a top five team and go backwards. I've well, never Notre seen Dame, that in my life. Mizzou. Yeah. I mean, I mean, come on. Mizzou's just not good. Yeah. I no, mean, it's, it, a, it's a freaking joke and we all yeah. know it, but as long as we keep winning, they can do whatever the hell they want. Uh, they they can't keep us out of the playoff. And yeah. all we got to do is beat Bama or Georgia, and then we'll win the title. So who cares? Uh, the biggest question I've got for you boys is, um, you know, the Big Ten is expanding, thank God, because the Big Ten kind of sucks this year, in my opinion, uh, except for, you know, Penn State's look good. Obviously, the team we're not going to talk about uh, has continued to win despite not looking great. Uh, but the two teams that are going to join the Big Ten uh, have actually looked really good. And I'm talking about USC, obviously, and uh, UC- UCLA. Um, nobody picked UCLA to be any good this year. I thought they might have a chance with DTR coming back. I love DTR, as James knows. Uh, dude is a badass. And he looked like a badass yesterday taking out uh, Utah. Um, Utah's a good team. And DTR went all over him for four touchdowns. I think some people didn't think DTR could really throw the ball, but he can. Uh, he also can run it. I- I'll ask you guys both. I want to get both your opinions. Uh, James, you can go first. How good is UCLA and how good is USC? And do either of these teams have a chance um, to go? I mean, we got a lot of football left, obviously. We're at week six. But I didn't really expect I – thought, I thought UCLA would be improved. I thought USC obviously got a bunch of transfers, but um, they both look like they've got a chance. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on those two teams that are undefeated? Well, I mean, you look at UCLA's schedule on the way out. Uh, well, first off, I mean, this is once again a testament to Chip Kelly's line of scrimmage play. I mean, everybody keeps talking about the quarterback, the running back, and their speed on the outside – What they don't talk about is how he really built strong line play on both sides of the line of scrimmage. And that really showed last year when Charbonnet was running the ball with DTR. I mean, that that game against LSU, I mean, heck, Montana was too small compared to some of those holes they were getting. Um, And you look at the rest of the schedule on the way out at Oregon, which, you know, going up to Eugene's always pretty tough. Then their next hardest game is USC at home up in Rose Bowl. I mean, there's a chance you could see UCLA maybe being that fourth team or USC being that fourth team in. Um, You know, everybody downplays them because they they struggle against Bowling Green to begin with. They struggle against South Alabama. But since then, I mean, they've been just trucking teams. I mean, DTR is just playing phenomenal and is really having a very good year that's quiet. I mean, it's almost rem- reminiscent of Robert uh, uh, RG3 when he won the Heisman that year. But what are your guys' thoughts? Well, you, you bring up a really good point. If you go back to Chip Kelly's heyday at Oregon, they were running the spread, but they were running the ball. They weren't, yeah. and they were downhill, hitch in the mouth. Um, they just did it differently, right? Now everyone's kind of adopted that. And that's the one thing I've noticed the most about UCLA when I've seen them play is they're physical again. They yeah, have yeah. not played like that in a long time. Oh, and yeah. Coach Kelly's finally got them going in that direction. If you go go look at the stats. We call it the top five teams, undefeated teams in the country right now. They are able to run the ball and create turnovers. So if you think of where USC and UCLA is at, they're doing that. And that's why they're undefeated right now. So, I mean, football is a really simple game, complicated by dumb men, right? <laughs> Bottom line is you got to line up and be able to run the ball. And this is where Ohio State's dangerous. You look at what Alabama did last night. They overcame four turnovers. And when they had to run the ball and they were one-dimensional, it didn't matter. Yeah. Right? And that's what's going to win. I mean, I hate to say it, but Michigan's doing that too, right? Yeah. They had a really sloppy game. 
And then second half, they committed to the run and they won 20, you know, 21 nothing second half. So go yeah. look at the top teams right now, what they're doing. Yeah, they can throw the ball and yeah, they got all these star athletes, but at the end of the day, they're playing good defense and running the ball. Well, Steve, talking about that Michigan game, don't you think it kind of got in their head after Mike Hart had that seizure? Because I, I remember sure. watching when Coach Kilg had seizures at Minnesota and I mean, you just looked in their eyes and they were gone. Like some of the players that weren't used to it, they could just, they struggled with it because they just, they, you know, they're, they're, it's one of their brothers, you know? Yeah, think about how much time you guys spend together. Yeah. And yeah. The, I mean, from the top guy to the bottom guy, anyone that has something like that happen, you're going to be affected. Yeah. But again, you know, they overcame it and they kind of went back to their roots and said, okay, well, how do you get through this? You got to be able to run the ball. Yeah. And that's yeah. where, if you, you know, back to the USC, UCLA thing, if I had to pick one of those two teams right now that I see making a deeper run, it's UCLA because of that. Yeah. Okay. USC have got the star power. Um, they got the playmakers. But they got to get a fourth and two and everyone knows it. Yeah. Can they do it? And right now, UCLA is showing a little bit more than that for me. But yeah. they're both really good football teams. And the fact that they're going to be coming to the Big Ten will be good. It'll be really interesting to see how those guys react coming to Penn State in November. Yes. You know, playing Minnesota <laughs> in October. Um, right. You got some of these recruits that literally have never seen snow. I was, I never saw snow until I went to Ohio State. Right. Not a lot of snow in Boca Raton, is there? Right. Oh, so, what? That's a different, <laughs> different animal. I mean, it sounds right. It sounds silly, but it's true. I mean, you heard everyone complaining about the Dolphins because they put the opposing team in the sun. Now it's an advantage. You got to use it. Right. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the future. Yeah. Well, they, hey, this, this UCLA team can travel. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter what the weather is. You got DTR um, running the read option, and you got Charbonnet. I, I, we, we talked about him last year, James. This guy is a beast. And, you know, he was sharing carries with Britain last year. But this year, he's the man. And yesterday, let's – I mean, Utah, I don't know how great they are overall, but they're a pretty decent defense. And he ran 22 times for 198 yards. I don't know if you're a math major, but that's nine yards a clip. Um, that's, that's phenomenal. And, uh, you know, they, they, he still threw, I think DTR had four touchdowns, but they didn't really even need to throw it. Um, they, they can get it done. So when you can run the ball, uh, you're, you're in good shape and, um, that's gonna, that's gonna travel no matter who you play or where you play, uh, when you can run the football like that. So we'll see, we'll see if they can continue, uh, what they're doing, but I've got to be honest. I didn't think they would both be undefeated at this point. One one more thing before we leave. Did you guys see that highlight from the Washington game last week, where uh, they did uh, DTR did an RPO and he kept it, and uh, the two uh, the linebacker and the quarterback yeah. uh, targeted each other. He he basically did a whoop, and then yeah. they both hit each other, and he walked in. It was just yeah. like, holy crap, that guy's ankles are freaking strong. My yeah. God, I'm surprised they didn't, the ref didn't throw a flag and eject both the both the defenders for targeting each other. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about Incredible. that, but yeah, I did post that on our Twitter page, so you should yeah. uh, take a look. Uh, it, that dude's a badass man, and um, I think he's gotten better each year. Oh and, yeah, and uh, that's why you know that's why UCLA is where they are. Um, is my opinion is they got a veteran quarterback who has been there for what seems like ten years. And uh, he's actually continued to improve. So, uh, oh, Chip, you may not like him, but he does know uh, what he's doing. I, I always think back to that coaching uh, staff that had uh, Ryan Day, Chip Kelly, and Dan Mullen on it uh, running the offense. And I'm like, holy shit, I would have loved to have been a, uh, uh, a guy playing offense on that team because they, they had three guys that knew how to get it done. Um, but we need to discuss the other game that ha occurred yesterday. And for that, we're going to bring in a little bit of help. We got Russell uh, Smith from Fox Sports Knoxville ready to join us. I'm going to pop him in. Russell, can you hear us? I got you guys. Do you have me? We do. Thank you so much for coming on with us today, man. Uh, first and foremost, how are you feeling after that victory yesterday, buddy? Well, we got a little cold going around uh, the Smith house right now. I've got two <sighs> kids. So it's just like I had a cold like a month ago just got over it. Now I got a new one. That's, that's awesome. how it goes when you have two kids in public school. So, uh, but when you beat LSU and your, your team is five and oh, that you cover and Tennessee is relevant again in the college football universe, you've got not just game day 
is coming back, and so is SEC Nation. I don't even know if that's a thing. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> Knoxville is the epicenter of the college football universe again. It feels like old times. It's pretty cool. It, it, it's crazy, man. I mean, I've, I've, uh, you know, I grew up here um, from Ohio originally, but I grew up here and then I moved to Ohio for 20 years. Then I came back and the whole time I was gone, they sucked. Uh, but it <laughs> seems like, uh, you know, football has returned. And and I want to ask you, Russell, really. Well, they, they, we just needed you to come back, man. That, 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 there's a That's lesson what, there. You can't leave anymore. You can't sorry about that. That's what we were missing. Uh, <laughs> that was a missing ingredient. But um, you know, what, what's the difference, Russell, in your opinion? I mean, we've had, they've had nine coaches, uh, all, uh, some super idiots uh, yeah. that have come through, but I was telling the, the boys here before we came on, I, when they made the hire, I was kind of like, eh, I don't know. I mean, th this is a tall task and I don't know if this guy can do it. What, what's been different since Heupel took over uh, this Tennessee squad? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just as simple as as the coach. I think they've made three bad hires before then, and I think Josh Heupel is, has proven to be a good hire so far. I mean, I, I'm with you. I think when Heupel was – the that's the ironic thing is everybody was on board with all the other three hires. They talked themselves into it. Oh, Derek Dooley's going to do – you know, we're going to emulate the Saban model. Oh, Butch Jones is – he's going to recruit and, and be good and all this stuff. And – then, you know, Pruitt, obviously, it's, it's, it's another saving guy. And when um, Heupel was hired, it, it wasn't met with a lot of fanfare here in Knoxville. He was not Danny White's first choice. Danny White tried to hire um, uh, Elliott, the, the guy up, Tony Elliott, who's at um, Virginia now. And I'm not so sure that would have, wouldn't have been another bad hire. He had to go down the list. Take, he gave it to the one guy he knew he would take it, which was his coach at UCF. And when Heifel was announced, it was not a very sexy hire. Everybody was kind of like, oh, man, like, really? We're having to settle again? And, you know, last year was good. Um, they beat the hell out of Missouri and South Carolina. but I, And they flashed a little bit against Alabama and maybe even Georgia. But I don't think anybody was all on board. You know, they lose a bowl game to Purdue and Nashville. And it was just kind of like, well, you know, I hope this works out. And they have come out this year and managed to win uh, their three biggest games. And I'll tell you what, I, I think that they, they're they going to be in this game with Alabama. I mean, I, I think they can score. If Alabama doesn't have Bryce Young, I think they can win. So this is going to be a just huge measuring stick to, to see if this hype is for real around Tennessee right now. But, uh, I mean, Josh Heupel is just – he's hitting all the right buttons right now, uh, everything he's doing – is working. I mean, look at the game yesterday. Tennessee puts the ball on the ground three times. They recover all three fumbles of their own. And uh, you had the one at the end of the first half where Hooker gets blindsided, he gets blasted. Not only do they recover the ball, uh, the true freshman <clears throat> Dylan Sampson picks it up and runs it for a couple of yards, puts them in position to go for it on fourth down, and they are able to maintain possession. So not only is he making the right calls, he's getting a little bit of luck as well. What, what's been the biggest difference from a culture standpoint from Heupel to the previous coaches that's made that evolution that much quicker? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think um, there's just an air of positivity. I think Heupel has allowed this to become a team, a squad player led team where, you know, previously and you know we won't go through all of them individually but let's just talk about the last guy and that was jeremy pruitt ruled with an iron fist um i knew guys who were on that staff he was not a pleasant guy to work for uh he belittled people he belittled his uh his subordinates his assistant coaches his players did not um have close relationships with him and i don't know that hypel is uh the the most happy-go-lucky guy but he kind of i don't want to say has a hands-off approach but he lets the players lead. And, man, what can you say about Hendon Hooker? As great a player as he is, uh, he is an excellent leader, man. You can tell his teammates just respect the hell out of him and would follow him into any battle. And so I think that there's just an air of positivity. And, hey, when you're winning, that stuff, it just compounds, you know. It, it gets bigger each week. And I think that um, there's just a – a, a positive feeling around Tennessee. You know, we talk about the Saban model and trying to hire Pruitt and Dooley and 
there's everybody thinks that, well, you know, you have to be a hard ass to be a great coach or you have to be this, you have to be that. You got to do it the way this guy does it. And I think Heupel's kind of got kind of an original way about him. I think he's doing it his own way. I think it's different. You know, we'll see if it works. I don't I don't know if they're going to beat Alabama or not this year. Uh, but uh, so far, the results are pretty good right now. Yeah, there's no doubt. And um, it, it's been a completely uh, different looking team since since Heupel got here. And, and last year, you know, they were they were a little thin. Uh, let's let's saying it nicely. I mean, at some positions, <laughs> the, the first the starting lineup was pretty good. But, you know, when somebody when an injury occurred, you, you could tell the drop off was substantial across the board. Um, but the biggest thing was was figuring out the QB. And, and Steve, I want to get your opinion um, you know, Russell brought up a great point. You know, the quarterback makes a big difference. And when you've got somebody back there that can, um, you know, call the right reads and, and get you in the right play and, uh, you know, throw it and run it like he can, um, that's a big deal. What are your thoughts so far watching uh, Hooker and how good do you think this guy can be? So I want to expand on what Russell said about the coach. Um, that's how Hypo played when he was at Oklahoma, right? They won a national championship and he let his players play. Um, it never was about him, right? And that's what I think you're seeing right now from a, from his coaching. And right? it's about the team, it's about the players. And I'm obviously a little biased, right? As a former quarterback, you love to see that. I think he's doing a really good job. And in particular, you're seeing that in the play of his quarterback, right? You can tell, and I'm not following Tennessee football as closely as you guys, but I'll tell you right now, just what I've seen and their interactions, and you can see how they're communicating, that's, that's showing up in his play right and a couple of times he got lucky but that's that's neither here nor there he's always in the right position to make those plays so there's a huge difference that i've seen this year versus last and if i look at you know going into the next week for tennessee they have as good a shot as anyone right now to win that football game and if they're going to continue to run the ball like they did yesterday right they were good on fourth down they have good third down conversions they do that against alabama especially the way alabama's turning the ball over right now that's a recipe for success yeah no, there's no difference I was sitting there thinking about it. When's the last time you've had that, this type of meaningful game in Knoxville? Like, I, I, I'm i struggling to try to remember that, where it's been – the hype has been this big. I can go back to the 90s, but I know there's been games since then. There have been big games here. We were talking about this on our post-game show yesterday, and I think unless I'm missing something, unless I'm glossing over something, I mean – this is first of all, this is the first time Tennessee and Alabama have both been ranked since I want to say uh, 2006 or, or maybe 98. Um, yeah. It's the first time that they've both been undefeated when they played since 1989. Holy so, crap. I, you know, I mean, it seems like hyperbole and I didn't want to, uh, you know, put too much into it yesterday. But the more I think about it, I think this is the biggest game in Knoxville since the 1998 Florida game, which is, you know, everybody yeah. kind of recognizes as one of the, uh, if not the best, one of the two or three best games ever at Neyland Stadium or biggest games. Now, if if Alabama comes in here and blows Tennessee out, then like, you know, nobody will, will uh, it, it won't go down as, as a big game. But uh, with everything riding on it, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's absolutely huge, which, again, just speaks to Heupel and, and what he's done. Like, nobody thought that Tennessee would be in this position, and this wasn't even a conversation, something we were thinking about in the offseason. So it's just a tremendous opportunity for uh, Tennessee and Heupel. You know, right now, it's there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of swagger around the program. Fans are happy. And I think the rest of the, the college football universe is kind of like, you know, they're kind of, okay, all right, Tennessee, I see you. If they win this week, everything changes. You know, I mean, it's like you, you beat Alabama at home, the number one team in the country. Um, you know, I call it what you want. I, I think Tennessee, it's kind of like you've arrived. You know, I mean, you're you're in the conver- you're in the conversation for a conference championship. You're in the con- the playoff conversation. I mean, you've gone from a cute little uh, upstart to part of the national title talk which i mean just sounds crazy to talk about but it's the truth yeah no it definitely is and uh the 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 hype is real and um you know it was kind of interesting and and nice to see uh you know usually tennessee's the ones paying all the coaches and uh (laughs) shelling out cash to guys that are on the opposing sidelines or whatever but what i really loved yesterday was watching 
old Beauregard down there on the field uh, while they're getting their ass kicked and thinking about how LSU's dropped $27 million this year on uh, the raging Cajun who left the door, old Eddie Ogeron, he got $17 million to leave, and they paid Brian Kelly $10 million to come in, and they're still getting their ass kicked. So $30 million bucks doesn't get you as far as it used to, apparently. Uh, but I, I was blown out by that game yesterday. I couldn't believe it. Um, I thought they would beat LSU. But, Russell, I got to ask you, did you envision a, a shellacking like we saw? No, and the the most impressive part to me was the def- defensive performance. Yeah. I picked Tennessee to yeah. win 41-38 to 38 on our show Friday. Uh, I thought it was going to be a close game. I thought it was going to be a shootout, mostly just because I didn't think Tennessee's defense is very good at all. And so uh, to have LSU shut out through the first quarter, only seven points in the first half held to, I think it was something like 50 yards rushing, five sacks, nine tackles for loss. Uh, secondary still gives up some yards through the air when when the quarterback has time. Uh, there's there's uh, yards to be gained against Tennessee's defense, but that was the biggest surprise to me. I thought it was going to be a close game, and so um, that, that was really impressive. You know, if Tennessee starts defending now, I mean, look out. I, I thought their defense was – was very bad, quite frankly, coming into the game. And so uh, that was that was a huge surprise to me. There were a lot of people, fans, I think, you know, last week talking like, oh, I think Tennessee can blow these guys out. And I was always, whoa, 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 let's pump the brakes. Um, but it happened. And so that was kind of a conversation changer. Was it more of a surprise that it was in Baton Rouge since it's such a tough place to play? I mean, it's obvious LSU is kind of degraded a little bit their ta- talent from the change in coaches. Or, I mean, w- what are your thoughts on that? Sure. Baton Rouge is a very difficult place to play. Anybody who's been down there knows that it's one of the loudest stadiums and most hostile environments in the country. Um, I think, again, you know, Tennessee, Lady Luck, smiling on the balls. That that should have been probably the matchup of the day. I, I know the uh, CBS gods were probably happy with the way Alabama and AM ended up. But, you know, that was a 24-point spread. And um, uh, Tennessee gets to play there at 11 a.m. local time. Yeah. Uh, it is not the same place Yeah. 11 a.m. local time as it is 7 p.m local the, time it, those, those are, folks those folks hadn't gotten uh, the opportunity to get lubed up just yet. yeah uh, the, the difference uh tiger stadium between 11 a.m 7 p.m that we're talking about mars and venus those are two different planets <laughs> so yeah i mean tennessee got very fortunate and uh and you know lsu fumbles the opening kickoff tennessee God. scores it's 10 nothing before you can blink so even if those folks wanted to be rowdy tennessee takes them out of the game before it can even get going. So, and uh, my God, you know, Tennessee fans haven't traveled like that in some time. Jalen Hyatt, Tennessee wide receiver, after the game said, to be honest, it didn't even feel like it was a road game. There were so many Tennessee fans there. Vols absolutely took over Baton Rouge, took over the stadium. And again, something we have not seen in a long, long time. Yeah, there's no doubt. It, it's It's been a long time coming and I'm happy uh, for for all the the Vol Nation because you know they've seen some rough times and uh, you know there's been a lot of coaches there's been a lot of turnover and uh, it's nice to finally see uh, the balls back because I you know I remember when if we didn't if the balls didn't finish in the top five at the end of the year it was a, it was a bad season and that that you know I was wearing little boy trousers uh, when when that occurred so. Uh, it's nice to see again, but I, hey, you know, Nate, Nate, don't sell yourself short. You're still wearing little boy trousers. That's true. <laughs> well, hey, these look actually more like mom jeans, but you know, who's, who's counting. Uh, the, the question <laughs> I've got is, you know, I'm looking ahead now to next week and you know, we saw Bama last night. Um, you know, wasn't the greatest performance overall. Uh, it came down to the last play and they easily, <clears throat> could have lost that game. I'm glad they won because it's going to make yeah. this matchup on Saturday even better. And I'm going to be down there, uh, get soaking it all in. So I'm glad they won, but you know, how good is Alabama right now? And I want to get, uh, Steven Russell and James, I want to get all your takes on this. Um, you know, are they the number one team in the country? Does, does Tennessee, you know, match up well with them in your guys' mind, Russ, I'll let you go first. Um, what are you expecting from this game after seeing what you saw yesterday? 
uh, DraftKings had the line for Tennessee, Alabama on Friday. They offered a, a nine and a half point line. So um, now, now does that change after Tennessee had a very impressive performance and Alabama had a much closer than expected performance? I don't know what, it, you know, Bryce Young's status obviously figures a lot into this, but I think Tennessee has as good a chance as anyone. You know, I watched uh, a lot of Georgia and Alabama yesterday, and I did not see the juggernauts that we saw last year. I see flaws in both those teams. Now, I think, uh, you know, if, if I'm placing a bet today, I'd probably bet uh, Bama and Georgia to beat Tennessee. But um, I think Tennessee has as good a shot as anybody. I think that, um, you know, if Alabama turns the ball over, turnovers are going to be key in this game. Kicking game is going to be key in this game. I think Tennessee is going to be able to move the ball and score points against Alabama. And I just think who, you know, the availability of Young is critical because Tennessee has shown now uh, an ability to stop the run on defense. And Milrow was not very impressive throwing the ball yesterday. So I think that if uh, if if Bryce Young cannot go and Jalen Miller Milrow is starting at quarterback for Alabama, I think Tennessee can get some stops in there. And I think that you could see a close game. Now, if Young plays and he's healthy, then – Maybe we will get the 41-38 shootout I thought we were going to see this week down there in Baton Rouge. But to answer your question, I just I think Tennessee has as good a shot as anyone against the Tide. Well, Steve, I mean, if you're Hendon Hooker right now, thinking about next week, and you know Saban's going to take away something from you, what's your thought process going in? Automatically thinking you're probably going to have to audible to something else if you're running that hypo offense. Yeah, if I look at what Tennessee obviously did this week, I'm going to try to duplicate that, right? Yeah. I mean, they were balanced, and that's the that's the one way you beat an Alabama team, right? You got to be physical. You got to be able to run the ball, and Tennessee's been able to do that, right? They've been able to show that they can line up and be physical, which, candidly, in the last few years, they haven't been able to do that. So going into this game, I, I'm actually really excited for it because we haven't seen a Tennessee team like this in a while. Um, they're playing physical on defense, playing physical on offense, and – I don't change too much, right? I think that relationship with the quarterback and their head coach and what they're doing is going to show out and help. Right now, they don't have that in, you know, Tuscaloosa because Bryce Young's hurt. And, you know, Russell, you said it perfectly. Special teams and turnovers are going to dictate this game. Oh, yeah. You look at, I mean, right? And that's where, right now, I, I think Tennessee's doing a really good job. So, it'll be fun to watch. I think it's going to be a lot closer than people think. So, yeah. Alabama's field goal kicker struggle, missed a couple of easy field goals and, uh, Tennessee might have found another weapon. You know, we've been talking a lot about uh, lack of, you know, they don't have many kick returns, punt returns. It's kind of like, just, oh, man, just catch the ball. Don't fumble it. D. Williams plays for the first time last year. He was uh, the top Juco cornerback in the nation last year. He's been out with a shoulder injury, makes his debut, just about takes a punt back to the house in the first quarter yesterday. So, yeah, I think uh, special teams – it's, that's been a bugaboo for Saban through the years, man. He struggled with with field goal kickers and and things like that. So that'll be a critical area to watch. Because he hasn't needed them, <laughs> right? Yeah. They get the red zone, they score touchdowns. Yeah. Um, but you keep them out of the red zone or keep them out of the end zone and make them kick field goals, it's a different ball game. So hey, the, I, the, I the biggest thing, comment. too, I got to say about the last two games, Russ, they haven't had Cedric Tillman. Yes. And, and I've, I, you know, I thought that would affect this offense a little bit. I mean, did I think they would, you know, fail to score? Probably not. But I thought you would definitely, um, you know, feel his loss. And honestly, I forgot that he wasn't playing yesterday. I mean, how, I, I don't know, how do you not uh, miss a guy that, that's that good? And, uh, you know. It's crazy. He, he's an all-American wide receiver, and, and you're absolutely right. It, it doesn't feel like Tennessee misses him much. And I think what it does is, you know, sometimes a guy sprains an ankle, and it's like, oh, man, you're just rushing to get him back. And I don't think Tennessee has to do that because uh, I think 100% of Ramel Keaton, who's been his replacement, is better than 90% of Cedric Tillman. So I think you can uh, – you're, you're better off just letting him rest and, and recover and recuperate. But, yeah, Tennessee also played – yesterday without their starting left tackle, Gerald Mincy, who's, who's out with, uh, I believe he's in concussion protocol. Um, and somebody somebody uh, said, now, I mean, this could be debated, but somebody said yesterday on our post-game show that they would rather have, if they could only have one back next week, they'd rather have Gerald Mincy than Cedric Tillman. And, you know, that wow. on its surface just seems insane. But, you know, Alabama defense coming after you, 
you'd rather have your left tackle, better pass blocker out there than your all American wide receiver. I mean, that was, it's, it's actually a, a point that can be debated. I can imagine that Brew McCoy is like his headspace has got to be much better since he's finally living up to the hype that has gone through his recruiting aspects. I mean, it is, what have you seen from him? I mean, it, it just, it, what I saw yesterday was, I mean, it, it, what people expected him when he was coming out of college, out of high school. Yeah. I mean, he's just a physical force of nature. He's six foot three, 220 pound wide receiver. And, you know, Heupel's biggest strength as, you know, uh, as an offensive play caller is just getting matchups, just getting the ball to playmakers in space, creating that space. And then, you know, Hooker is obviously really smart quarterback, always knows where to go with the ball, hasn't thrown an interception yet this season. And you saw that a couple of times with McCoy. And you, you would think it was like, well, how do you lose a guy like that? You know, five star kid. That, but, I mean, it happens several times every game where you just see Brew McCoy running wide open down the field. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's a, a credit to him, first of all, for, for being dialed in. And he, he's obviously focused and, um, and a great player. And I think uh, it's just another credit to Heupel and his offensive system. Like, he's, he's going to get you the ball. If, if you're a wide receiver, you're a playmaker, he's going to find a way to get it to you and let you put up numbers. Steve, what were you going to say? I'm sorry, I completely cut you off. I was off. going to make a comment earlier. I'm going to date myself here, but I haven't talked this much Tennessee football since I played arena ball with Andy Kelly. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you right now, it's good to talk about it because I think college football is better when you see these teams that have had this great history do well. Um, so it's, it's been enjoyable, and got to give a little plug to my, butt, my buddy there, Andy. Were you on the Nashville Cats then? No, I played with him down in New Orleans, actually. Okay. Um, All right. And then in Kansas City. So got to know Andy pretty well. And yeah. he always always didn't hesitate to kind of rub in Tennessee football. So AK, the pride of Ray County. Right. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> hey, Andy Kelly was a hell of a quarterback, man. Um, yeah, he was. I, I saw him get some some games done. That's for damn sure. That was uh that takes it back to the Carl Pickens. That's what uh, I was gonna say. It was Carl Pickens, Alvin Harper days, wasn't he? Uh, that was uh -huh. Carl Pickens. I, I can't remember if he had Alvin Harper, but that was definitely Carl Pickens and uh, Carl played uh, both ways, actually, yep. uh, his first year. He played defensive back and wide receiver and uh, was just a freak of nature. And, and you know, Tennessee's, uh, you know, Tennessee was the real deal. And, uh, you know, this last, ever since, I, it was my opinion, Russell, and I, this is, you know, for another show, but we're going to talk about it anyway. I, I just felt like when they fired Fat Phil in the middle of the season, that was like the beginning of the end. I mean, I, I get it. Some people wanted Fat Phil gone. Uh, some people wanted to move in another direction. And, and I know you've talked about this at length, but that kind of started it on the wrong you know, path. And, and from there, you go and hired Lane Kiffin, who had done nothing. And that was your replacement to a guy who had won a national championship. I felt like that's kind of what, what started all of this. And it's taken a while to, to get it back. What, what are your thoughts on on the beginning of the demise? Yeah, so uh, obviously we've talked a lot about this for 15 years now here <laughs> on uh, Knoxville Radio, and I, I don't know if there's a consensus yet, but um, I've always said it's not about the firing, it's about the hiring. You got to you make a good hire. And, you know, Kiffin, uh, yeah, he, he screwed Tennessee over big time, and that led to Derek Newley, which led to Butch Jones, which, you know, obviously uh, we all know what happened, but um, – you know, if if Kiffin stays, is it different? He's he's obviously doing well at Ole Miss, and I think you could very well see him at Auburn next year, where where I think he would do well. But um, you know, whenever you uh, make a controversial firing, it's you, you got to get it right. And in 1992, Johnny Majors was you know he had Tennessee rolling. You just went through you know Harper and Pickens and all the great players that were on those early 90s teams, and yet Tennessee made a change because they had. Philip Fulmer waiting in the wings and you knew he was going to leave if you didn't give him the job. Um, I thought that was the right move was to go to Fulmer in 92. I thought the right move was to move away from Fulmer in 2008. I thought the uh, game had sort of passed him by and the program was stagnant. And, um, you know, you just you just made the wrong hire and then you compounded that mistake by making three wrong hires after that. So you just you just kind of bottomed out. It's it's hard to hire a really good. I mean, look at college football. How many outstanding college football coaches are there? Four or five? 
out of yeah. 130 teams, there's like, yeah. you know, you know, maybe a dozen good coaches, maybe three or four really good coaches. It's just hard, man. The, there's not a lot of supply out there and there's a ton of demand. So it's, it's really hard as Tennessee has found out the hard way. But um, I think that, um, you know, they, they just made some bad hires o- over the years and, uh, and it didn't work out. And, you know, we, we've also learned in the past 15 years, you know, don't, don't uh, crown a guy too early. Like I said earlier, there was a time when Tennessee fans thought Jeremy Pruitt was going to be the guy. There was a time, t- you know, Tennessee's been here before. In 2016, they were 5-0 and yeah. and in the top 10, okay? And, yeah. and the next year, Butch Jones got fired. So as happy as everybody is with Hypel right now, uh, they still haven't won anything. And um, college football is fickle and it can change quickly. But for right now, uh, it looks like Tennessee has made a good hire. And I, I think it's really, it's as simple as that. And it's as complicated as that, if that makes any sense. you you got to make a good hire, but that's really hard to do. Yeah, yeah but and this is kind of a question for both you, Russell and Steve, is... I mean, it's much different in college than you see in the NFL where like my brother played for Lou Holtz at Minnesota and he always talked about like Lou was not an X's and O's guy, but this guy can make you believe in stuff Mm. that really you sit there and think about rationally you couldn't do (laughs) and that the best coaches today are those people that can motivate those people from being good to great, great to elite I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Um, Russell, I'll jump in really quick. Couldn't agree more, right? You're dealing with 18 to 21 year old kids, right? And now you have NIL, you have all these different things that are getting thrown in there. How do you keep that motivation, right? If you're a three and two team, you're Texas A&M, Jimbo Fisher's got to find a way to keep those boys in it. Because if not, I can just go hop in the transfer portal and go to USC, right? They have 54 guys you know, transfer over to USC. So there's a lot of different factors that go into it. And I think, Russell, you're dead on. It's simple, but really complicated. Um, but they have to be able to motivate these guys. It's not the X's and O's. It's keeping an 18 to 21 year old kid focused, out of trouble, and doing what they're supposed to do on and off the field. That's a lot of work, right? Um, then the ones that can do that are going to be the best coaches. So, and I think that plays out, right? You see that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, talking about there are only a handful of great coaches. I mean, I think that's probably something they all have in common, right? Saban, mm-hmm. Dabo, um, <clears throat> you know, we, you go through the list. I mean, there, it seems like those guys are all pretty good at connecting with the younger generation. Um, convin- you know, it's, it, Steve can talk about it. It's, it's hard playing college football. It's a lot of hard work. And, yeah. um, you know, you probably don't want to get up at 6 a.m. to go hit the weights or – or whatever, but you have to be convinced that it's worth it and, and to do it. And that's, as anybody who has kids knows, sometimes that, that's difficult to convince young people to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> my, my daughter just wants to do the opposite of what I tell her. It, it's yeah. not even really what I say. It's, oh, that's what you want me to do? Okay, I'm going to do exactly the opposite of what you asked me, Dad. And uh, that's kind of how our, our household rolls. But, uh, you know, we... We've seen this before, as you said, Russell, the, the, the old Tennessee, we'd be given, a, um, you know, giving the guy a 10 year extension and a raise right now. So that that's probably going to happen tomorrow. But, um, you know, I think this time we've seen a lot more substance uh, behind it. And, you know, I, I was never a uh, big Butch Jones fan. I, I just never believed in that guy. Um, I thought he was a snake oil salesman. Um, I still think he is. So I, I, Josh Heupel at least played football and wasn't in the band and uh, <laughs> you know, and he, he knows what the hell he's doing. So I think, I think they're in good hands, but you know, it, this is going to be a, a big game and, and obviously, you know, it doesn't get any easier because then you've got to play Georgia and then you're going to have to play probably Bama again in the SEC championship. So I say, enjoy it right now, uh, soak it all in. And then, you know, Hope for the best on Saturday, but I, I definitely think this is the best position and the best team that Tennessee has had in a while, uh, especially like we said before with the depth. I mean, Tillman's been out, left tackle out, still been able to run. And I, and I was impressed with the way they ran the ball yesterday um, with, with Small out there uh, having over 120 yards rushing. That that's that was uh, something that I didn't expect either. So 
Um, you know, my last question for you, Russ, is um, if they beat Alabama, where do uh, where does Tennessee get ranked? Wow, they, go, they pop up to one. I mean, you beat number one, you're one, right? Yeah, I mean that seems like a big jump. I don't know. Um, yeah. I guess they're number eight right now, so you've got seven teams, including Bama, ahead of them. I mean, you could certainly make the case. I mean, that's sound logic. You beat to be the man, you got to beat the man, right? That's and damn right. If you're the the lineal champion, you're the guy, who, the man who beat the man. Then I, I think you put him up there. But um, I'm sure Georgia, Ohio State, uh, Clemson will all have sound claims right there. I just think it's one of those things where if if you win, you you control your own destiny at that okay. point. And so, you know, who cares where you're ranked? Because if you if you continue to win and uh, then you're going to be, you're going to have the chance to play for it at the end. Now, I guess, th- th- again, this is just uncharted waters for Tennessee fans. Like I've never really thought about college football seeding and the advantages that that gives. Yeah. I guess you want, <laughs> you want, you want to be number one so you can play number four, right? Exactly. Uh, this is just a, a conversation we've never had here in Knoxville, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, you're, you obviously have to play Georgia too. I, if, it, and again, I can't believe I'm about to say what I like. We're even having this conversation. Like if you go 12 and zero, <laughs> you win the SEC championship, which I mean, ludicrous, but I, I guess that's what the conversation we're having. Then you'll be number one at the yeah. end of the year. So uh, yeah. that's, you know, it's just good to control your own destiny from that standpoint. Hey, after yesterday's win, you're allowed to say it. I mean, just say it. Let it out. Uh, <laughs> a lot of football we're... left to be played, guys. A lot of football. That's where we are. No, hey, no we're, we're only halfway through. You know, you don't stop yeah. the game at halftime, you know. Hey, that's true. But this has been a good half uh, for the balls. And, and, you know, you might as well enjoy it because who knows you know, when you get it again. That's the best part about this game is just the ride. You know, it, it, it's the end. The, like, the sell, it, like, say you do win the national championship or get to the end. It, 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 but I mean, the ride is better than the actual ending itself because it's just so much fun going through the ups and downs. And that's what makes this game so special that it's just it's part of us. Yeah, no doubt. Well, we're going to have a big one here uh, in town uh, next week. Uh, hopefully the balls will come out on top because I'd love to see Nick Satan. Uh, get a little taste of his own medicine. Uh, that guy's been on top for a long time, and it's uh, it's time for somebody to take his ass down. So, wow, you're well still upset guys. that he left Michigan State, aren't you? Nate? No, I don't care about that. I just <laughs> wanted to, I just wanted to leave. Period. Uh, you know, you go somewhere. I don't care. Go do something. Get a hobby. Uh, you you but don't want to play any defenses anymore because it was not yeah. fun. No. <laughs> <laughs> I see you, buddy. Well, anyway, we'll see what happens. It's going to be a big game. Uh, I think uh, all eyes will will be back on Knoxville for the first time in a long time. And as Russell said, it's the uh, first time both teams have been undefeated since 1989. I think that – was that Gene Stallings? I, I can't even remember. Uh, uh, was, no, that would have been uh, – Bill Curry. Uh, Bill, Bill Curry. Curry. Well, 89? 89. That, sure. that would have 89, been 89, uh, Tennessee, Auburn uh, – uh, Okay, so we're dating ourselves, right? But this is back during a 10-team SEC. Yes. Arkansas and yeah. South Carolina, there was no SEC championship game. Tennessee, Auburn, and Alabama tied for right. the SEC championship that year. It was a three-way tie. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, Bill Curry at Alabama, Johnny Majors at Tennessee, Pat Dye at uh, Auburn. Good Lord. Was Sean Alexander. No, no 80, I'm thinking 98. 89 uh, would have been. Years later. 89 uh, was uh, Saran Stacy. I remember that's that. right on wow. Tennessee that year. Good Saran Lord. Stacey, that that's was a couple right. of years ago. But yeah, it's been a minute. It's hey, we're back. But anyway, thank you guys so much, Russ. Yeah. We appreciate you. Uh, Steve, thank you for joining us today and uh, another great uh, week of college football. And hope we, hopefully, we get some more. Oh, uh, wait, hold on a second. Week. Texas yeah. scored again in Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was the Red River shootout uh, on one side. It should have been the Orange River shootout because there was not much red yeah. going on. Uh, ah. Venables, uh, I thought he was supposed to be a defensive coach, but you could have fooled me yesterday. But uh, we'll see what happens. Anyway, thank you guys so much for coming on with us today. Uh, he's running the Ole defense. Yeah, he's running not much. <laughs> have a great rest of your weekend, and we'll uh, hopefully we can hit you on again sometime. Okay, guys? Hey, thank sure. you. See you soon. Yeah. Thanks, All guys. right, guys. Take it easy. Uh-huh.